Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Monday, February 22nd, 2021. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast, Yield Curve Control Coming. This is a question, but we imagine it's something that we're going to hear more and more uh, going into the near future. We have Treasury Secretary Janet Dingbat Yellen making some comments today. We have Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, going before Washington, D.C., Congress, a couple times this week, well, obviously once before the House Committee and the Senate this week, uh, is what he does. It's his biannual meeting with Congress, basically giving a an update to what the Federal Reserve's doing, how the economy's looking, et cetera, et cetera. We know the game. We know the song and dance. But it's likely that this is just another one-two punch, as I've been stating here for weeks uh, after we knew that Janet Yellen was going to get the nod to become the Treasury Secretary, and we knew she would obviously get confirmed, that there was going to be a lot of one-two punches from the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. And recall that Janet Yellen was the former chair of the Federal Reserve. Her successor was Jay Powell, who we're dealing with right now. So we'll get to some of those comments and what we're expecting to hear potentially this week from Jay Powell, but that's why we're bringing up the yield curve control question. We've been focusing on when we do our market performance recap, we do, uh, we've do. we been spending a little bit more time on where the yields are going because this could very well be a breaking point uh, within the markets. Now, time will, of course, tell, but I am imagining with the amount of publicity in the amount of speeches and interviews that are being conducted by the Treasury Department, by Janet Yellen, by Jay Powell, and by other members of the Federal Reserve, that they're in damage control, and they're trying to get in front of the story. Remember, this economy right now, it's all about the narrative. It's not about the fundamentals. The, the fundamentals have been in the gutter, and in a lot, lot, large portion of the country— they continue to deteriorate. Now, there are other portions that are doing well. We are a huge economy. And fortunately, we're a diverse economy. And diversification is a good thing. If one piece slips, well, then there's others to pick up the slack. That's why diversification is a good thing in an economy, in an investment portfolio, in anything. Okay, so that's the good thing that we still have going for us as an economy, that there is, still is diversification. And that a lot of jobs, at least with respect to higher paying jobs, have come back. Now, with respect to those lower paid wages, lower paying jobs, not so much. And we continue to see heartbreaking figures on a weekly basis, north of 800,000 for initial jobless claims. Terrible revision last week a terrible number last week, and right now there is no end in sight because we still have lockdowns, we still have restrictions, and even when we hear of things reopening in some of the larger states, which of course are some of the larger economies in the country, well, we're going to do it in a few weeks. So we still have to wait a few weeks, maybe a month, and then it's not going to be at 100% capacity. I saw a headline earlier today that I think New York City is going to open up movie theaters on March 15th. So that's a month from now at 25% capacity. That's like a slap in the face. I mean, it's good that they're opening up 25% capacity. I mean, uh, the owners of those businesses are still responsible for 100% of the cost of that building. They don't just get to pay 25% of the rent, 25% of this, that, or the other. They have to pay for everything. And that's what these people, these, these politicians, whether they're a mayor or governor, doesn't matter, seem to not understand. And this has been going on for a year. That's the other thing that makes this so devastating. When we talk about initial jobless claims, still being a couple hundred thousand higher than where we were during the depths of the great financial crisis. And that was for a few weeks, 650, 660,000 during the great financial crisis. Now, one year into this debacle, we're still 800,000, 850, 900,000. So this is just giving you the scope. This is giving you the perspective of what's going on. And of course, this is part of the narrative that look how devastating these numbers are. 
look how bad the picture is out there that you that you now have a chair of the Federal Reserve coming out and saying the official unemployment figure is wrong. And I continue to harp on this because that's news. That is news. They never do this type of stuff. Never. But they have to play it up for the narrative that they're trying to sell us. That the Fed has to do more. They have to print more money. They have to throw more money into the system. They have to expand their balance sheet, which, of course, is at a record high at $7.55 trillion per last week. And it's going to continue to go up. But they need a narrative. They need to justify those actions. Well... Our mandate at the Federal Reserve is a dual mandate. We need stable prices. They fail miserably there. And full employment, which, of course, they're failing miserably there. So we're trying to make good on what we're supposed to do. And we think if we can continue expanding our balance sheet, and if we can continue to convince Congress to spend more money that they don't have, but that's why we're going to expand our balance sheet. That's why we're going to basically monetize the debt. We're going to bail the government out. Well, then we'll be back at full employment. Go ahead and spend another $1.9 trillion that we don't have. We'll finance it, and we'll be at full employment uh, sometime next year, they think. Not going to happen. The $1.9 trillion is probably going to happen in some form or another, but the full employment picture is not going to happen. That's going to take years, if it ever gets back to those levels. It'll take years, believe me when I tell you. So there's a lot going on right now, and of course Wall Street was down for the day pretty much across the board, especially with the tech sector, the NASDAQ driven uh, down over 2%, I believe, at the close. Um, That's something to be mindful of. And it's, again, something that plays into the narrative as to why you're seeing Janet Yellen come out being as aggressive as she has been, and why we're likely going to see Jay Powell be pretty aggressive uh, this week when he testifies before the House and the Senate. Because he's going to want to calm the storm. He's going to want to say that everything's fine. We are at the controls. He's going to push for Congress to do more. He's going to say that the national debt, which we're only a couple days away from hitting the $28 trillion figure, by the way, he's going to say that's nothing to worry about. We will contend with that later. He will point out the numerous revisions that many private and public firms are coming out and saying uh, that GDP is going to be higher than what was previously expected. You got people 5, 6, 7 percent in GDP. And to be perfectly honest with you, folks, that is a possibility. And the reason that's a possibility is because GDP is an arithmetic equation. We go over this all the time. It can be manipulated based upon what the government does. Government spending plus investment plus consumption plus net net exports. If you can increase your government spending or create policies that have consumption go up, you know, give them money, well, then you can increase it. But it doesn't mean that there was actual production that was taking place within the economy. And when you still have 18 plus million Americans on some form of unemployment insurance, yeah, there's not that much production taking place. You can print money. You can't print jobs. You cannot print growth. If you could, then we'd never have a recession. If we could, then there would never be a downturn. If we could, nobody would ever have to lose their job. Nobody would ever have to go out of business. And we wouldn't have to pay taxes anymore because the printing press is the cure-all. It's the panacea. But that's not how it works. And I wish those questions, as basic and as simple as they are, would be asked of Janet Yellen, of Jay Powell, other major bankers, other central bankers, and other politicians. That's the philosophical question that we have yet to have as a country with what our supposed elected officials and appointed bureaucrats are doing in our name with our money. I think it's due time to have that conversation, a national conversation. But no, don't do that. Mm -mm, Don't do that. Just distract everybody with... COVID-19 and the vaccinations, distract everybody with the weather, distract everybody with the Super Bowl, distract everybody with shenanigans in the political scene, just all distractions against the real stuff. And don't, don't misunderstand me. There's still important things within those other stories, especially with some of the weather-related incidents and what took place in Texas. I am not minimizing that at all. I'm just talking about other distractions that are constantly put in front of us 
the 24-7 news cycle. And these questions uh, that I just asked about our fiscal and monetary policies are never asked. And if they are on rare occasion, and sometimes you might get a little bit of a harder ball question in some of these conferences, news conferences, but rarely, but then whoever's asked the question just dodges it. They're not pushed. Well, let's see what these politicians come up with this week. I imagine it's going to be the same mumbo-jumbo. They're going to kiss Jay Powell's butt. They're going to thank him for saving the economy, saving the country, saving the universe. Without them, where would we be? We'd be much better off. That's where we'd be. But no politician wants to take responsibility. And no central banker does either. And that's why we're likely going to hear about yield curve control, because that's the next part of the story. And we'll get to that in a minute here. So we have market performance. We have the dollar index trading at 90 spot 02, 90 spot 02, flirting with that 89 handle. I do believe it touched uh, 89 spot something highs at some point during the day. So a lot of dollar weakness across the board. And of course, uh, that would mean we have some rallying uh, against some of those other currency pairs with the euro trading at $1.21, flirting with $1.22. British pound at $1.40, flirting with $1.41. The Australian dollar at 79 cents. And the New Zealand Kiwi at 73 cents. So some dollar weakness across the board for certain today. Bitcoin also gave back some of its big spike that we witnessed last week. Giving back about 4% right now at $52,000 per coin. And Janet Yellen went after Bitcoin again today, calling it uh, inefficient. Saying that it's a way for money launderers and criminals uh, to get away with their crimes, you know. And, you know, th that's true. Bitcoin is inefficient compared to other cryptocurrencies that exist. Uh, there's no doubt that there are criminals who are using Bitcoin to hide their transactions. But at the end of the day, this is really Janet Yelling trying to say, Duh, don't be stepping on the turfs of the banks because the banks, they, the big banks, they love laundering money. That's a big part of their business. I'm being serious, by the way. Money laundering is a huge part of the banking system. You remove all of that illicit cash, the drug money, the gun running money, the human and sex trafficking money, and anything else that goes on out in the streets. You take that money away, what do you think is going to happen to this economy? What do you think is going to happen to the banking system? Don't be naive. Just think about how much money that is. You've seen the pictures of all the money that gets stacked up in these drug houses. And those are small players. Think about the big whales out there. Hmm? Take that money out of the banking system, take it out of the economy, and watch this country implode. So it's a turf battle is what it comes down to. Now, there are, like I said, there are legitimate arguments against Bitcoin. But the one about the illegal activities going on, that's laughable. I mean, it's before it even comes out of her mouth, as soon as she starts saying the words about that, you just have to start laughing. I mean, we've been counterfeiting money and laundering money in this country for God knows how long. And now all of a sudden they're concerned about Bitcoin. Give me a break. Right now, Dow Jones Industrial Average is up about two, well, let's see, three, well, what is this? About two thirds of 1%. We have the S&P 500 up about four-tenths of 1%. And the NASDAQ 100 is up two-thirds of 1% in overnight futures trading. Of course, anything can happen overnight. This is a little bit of a rebound from today's session. Uh, the Japanese cash trade put on a gain of about four-tenths of 1%. See a red across the pond in Europe. Cash trade in Australia is up about one-half of 1%. Biggest loser was, again, the NASDAQ. So leading the way down were some of those big tech shares. So Apple gave back 3% for the day. Tesla gave back 8.5%, trading at $714 per share, almost in bear market territories defined by a 20% decline from a recent top. So that's a doozy. Now we'll see if that's just some sort of uh, correction. Obviously, a correction is morally defined as a 10% correction, 10% decline. This is being a 20% decline bear market. But you know, we've seen these types of swings before in some of these big name stocks. Tesla, of course, to me, is the poster child or one of the poster children of this bubble, almost everything bubble. So to see these types of declines on a daily basis is not going to surprise me to the downside and to the upside. Uh, it's a penny stock. We have broken our markets and we see these types of swings because this is what happens when you turn the printing press on and think everything's going to be perfectly A-OK. -okay. It's not. 
Microsoft giving back 2.7%, Amazon giving back 2%, Facebook giving back one half of 1%, and Intel giving back three and two thirds percent. So again, a, a solid down day for NASDAQ. And as I've been saying here for a long time, and this is, you know, not my saying, this is how it's, this is a saying that's been out there for a long time. What leads up leads down. And I don't know if this is going to be the start of a bigger sell-off or not. But when we get to the yield picture in a moment, it's something to really start paying attention to because something is starting to give. To me, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The question is, will the policymakers be able to calm the markets? And we're going to find that out as we progress through this week and next because I think it's going to be a... Uh, I, I really think it's going to be somewhat of a fork in the road here. But we have uh, WTI trading at $62.54 a barrel. Brent at $62.25. Natural gas, $2.94. So breaking down below that three handle. Gold had a good day, $1,811 an ounce. Silver had a good day as well, $28.08 per ounce in overnight trading. And, you know, we have lumber hitting an all-time high. And copper doing pretty well as well. But there's no inflation, folks. Pay no attention to anything going up in price. Just pay attention to the stuff that you don't need. You don't all, you're no longer buying. And if those prices are going down, well, that's what you're supposed to pay attention to. Then Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note yielding 1.37%. Okay, so there's the question. This is the yield question. This is the yield curve control coming question. How much higher will the Federal Reserve tolerate? 1.44, 1.45, 1.5%, 1 1.6. How much higher will they go before they really start doing something with this issue? Because they're going to have to do something. Because it's as clear as day that the economy and the stock market and other markets for that matter cannot tolerate rising yields. They just can't do it. We talked about this many, many times before. There's Capital Economics presentations on this. Check them out. YouTube or on our website, thecapitalnews.com. It does not take that big of an increase to interest rates to prick this bubble to do some damage, to sort of bring about a correction. And that's what's needed. That's what's definitely needed. And it's going to be more than a correction. 10% that's needed. It's going to be devastating and destructive when all of this comes crashing down. And that's what's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. We couldn't tolerate 2, 2 and a quarter percent on the Fed funds rate back in 2018. Couldn't do it. Then you had the 10-year, let me say, let me bring it up. Where were we? Back in the fourth quarter of 2018, we we're about 3%, 3.25%. Three Couldn't tolerate that on the 10 year note. 3%, 3.25%. Three and, three and, and we were told that that was the greatest economy ever in the history, not only of the country, but of the planet. That was the story that Trump and Kudlow and Mnuchin were always saying this is the best. Well, then why couldn't the economy nor the stock market handle a 10-year note at three and a quarter percent? It couldn't do it. Couldn't handle the Fed funds rate at two and a quarter. Couldn't do it. We have even more debt now. The system is even more fragile now. And there's no end in sight. So what makes you think that we're going to be able to get back to that level without... Uh, there being some sort of misstep or hiccup somewhere along the way. And it could be a big misstep. It could be a big hiccup along the way. I don't think we're going back to three and a quarter percent, at least not smoothly. I mean, and I'm talking about without there being some sort of uh, correction or bear market or something rattling loose and breaking within the system. Can we get back up to those numbers? Absolutely, we can. Absolutely. But not cleanly. Not just a nice steady march from where we are, 1.4% back up to 32 No, that will not be a smooth transition at all. That will be an extremely bumpy and volatile ride. And the central bankers know it. Fed knows it. The ECB knows it. 
This was always the question. Always the question. When will the market say enough is enough? And this is how the markets will start to signal that to the rest of us. Yields start going higher. We talked about inflation, fighting inflation. That the Fed is going to fight inflation with inflation. Inflation occurs at the printing press. It's an increase to the money supply. End of story. It has effects that makes its way across the economy at different times to different degrees. That's what we are witnessing. Financial asset prices, all-time record highs on valuation metrics as well. Housing prices, all-time highs. Okay? That's where it has gone first. And it has always been making its way through utilities and food as well. But now that's really where we're going to start to see it. In commodity prices, in food prices. We talked last week about Kraft Heinz and ConAgra saying, hey, we don't really see any end in sight to these commodity prices going up. And even if that does reverse, uh, what we've already had to bear, we're going to start passing that on to our consumers. That is the first of many other messages that is going to be coming across the wires from other companies saying the same thing. We cannot continue to just eat these costs. Our margins are getting squeezed. We can't do it. So those costs are going to be passed on to the consumer. And as I've been staying, saying here many times over, don't just pay attention to the price. Also pay attention to the volume that you are receiving. So write these things down. What are you getting? Are you getting 20 ounces of something? Well, okay, well, what happens next time you go to the store? Is it 16 ounces? Is it 12 ounces? You get a few dozen of something, now you're only getting 30? Write these things down, pay attention. Because chances are you're going to get the double whammy. In due course, if it hasn't already happened, you're going to get the higher price and you're going to get less volume. These are the things you have to pay attention to. This is the economy. These, this is the market saying enough is enough. So these people, believe me when I tell you, are concerned. Because you have to read between the lines. When Jay Powell says that the official unemployment rate at 6.3% is really more like 10%, they're getting nervous. When Jay Powell says that the Federal Reserve has nothing to do with the recent run-up in stock prices, they're getting nervous and deflects and say, no, it's on anticipation of the $1.9 trillion stimulus, and it's because of the, the markets are anticipating a successful rollout of the vaccines across this country and across the globe. No. No. And he knows that's not the case. He knows that's part of the story, but he knows the real reason why markets and stocks keep going up. He knows why. They all know what they're doing. That's why the story, that's why the narrative is so important. That's why getting out ahead of these things is all they can do at this point. And hope, and hope that Wall Street and other investors and traders out there buy their BS. That's all it is. You have to buy these people's BS that they know what they're doing, even though these are the same people that caused this problem to begin with. Now, I think that's insanity, but that's where we are. So 1.4% on the 10-year, we got 2.18% on the 30-year, the long bond. Okay, that's something else that we got to pay attention to because it's the same song and dance. So you got these rates going up, excuse me, these yields going up, not because of economic growth. I'm not buying that narrative, not for a second, not for a second, not real growth. Okay, and let me stress that, real growth. You want to print the funny money, you want to spend, beg, borrow, throw that into the system, and you want to call that growth, fine, fine. That's just the math of it, but that's not the reality of it. Because it's not production. It's not investment. It's not savings. It's just a printing press. It's just an illusion. That's all it is. And they're trying to kick the can down the road for another six months with the $1.9 trillion monstrosity to push what they've already extended through Nobody Cares Act 1.0 and via Nobody Cares Act 2.0. They're going to extend it from mid-March to some point in September. Okay? Because they know what's going on too. They will just never admit it. 
because the narrative is, well, people are still suffering, and you want to be sympathetic, don't you? you? You have some empathy for these people who are suffering around the country, don't you? You're concerned about all of these small businesses, aren't you? You're concerned about people who are sick, aren't you? So we have to spend this much money. You understand how much money that is? We bring in about $3.5 trillion per year in taxation. We're going to spend $1.9 trillion, boom, like that, on top of everything else. People just don't ask questions. It, it's the narrative. People don't want to be put into a bucket that says, well, you're, you're, not, you're not sympathetic. You have no empathy for these people. You don't care about small businesses. Again, like I always tell you, look at what Congress calls a bill. And that's pretty much 90% uh, of the story right there. Patriot Act. You're, you're against it? Well, you must be unpatriotic. You're against the CARES Act? Well, then you must not care. <laughs> that's 90% that's of the story right there as to how these people are trying to pin other politicians and other people into buying their lunacy. It's that simple. Just what you call the bill. Well, how can you be against that? I was against it from the get-go. Still am against all these bailouts because they do not work and they cause this type of problem. So now what we're expecting Jay Powell to do this week potentially is to bring up yield curve control, which is basically going to say this is where the Federal Reserve wants the yields to go, wants them to stay there, and then hopes that the markets get them there. And if not, then the Federal Reserve is going to have to do some work behind the scenes to maintain that level. They're going to have to continue expanding their balance sheet. They're going to have to continue to buy treasuries across the curve or wherever they're concerned to bid up the prices to push down the yield. But as I've always stated here, yes, central banks are incredibly powerful institutions. Yes, federal governments are incredibly powerful institutions, but none of them, even their powers combined, are not more powerful than the markets themselves. And this is where you're going to see it snap. It's still going to be in the bond market, despite the fact that the bond market is busted and broken because it's been manipulated for the past decade, decade and a half. We're still going to see it here because that's still where most of the macro traders and investors live. It's still where they make their living. I mean, you look at the negative yielding debt that exists around the globe. I mean, on a value level, it's lost, I think, a few trillion over the past week or two. Meaning the prices have gone down. The, the, the people are losing their butts on debt around the globe. This is going to have huge ripple effects. Like I said, the stock market is the appetizer or the dessert. The bond market is the main course. Everybody pays more attention to the stock market. That's a little bit more exciting. More people can grasp that than they can the bond market. But it's the bond market that's the real enchilada. That's the big boy. And that's just as busted as the stock market is because of all the manipulation that's been taking place. And when that sucker goes, it's going to bring the whole house of cards down with it. And despite me being a precious metals uh, bull and a commodities bull. Yeah, you might get some salvation there. You might have some good diversification and hedges there if, you, if you're looking to that place. But when this comes down, there's there's no safe haven at the end of the day. Yes, something might bounce back, and I think th that'll be your precious metal space and commodities. But it, it, it's, it's, I think the, the analogy I used last week was it would be like the Hoover Dam breaking loose. There's really no safe haven when that happens. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong. But this is basically um, the physics of economics. I mean, you push with so much force in one direction for so long, there is going to be an opposite and equal reaction. It's just a matter of time. And I think with these increases in yields that we have been witnessing, if this continues, and if it can break through uh, some resistance on a technical standpoint of where we are right now, if it can break through some of these levels and continue higher, well, then that's what we're going to be in for. We're, we're going to be in for some further cracks within the dam. So the Federal Reserve and other central banks, as far as I'm concerned, are getting nervous. 
I think you can tell between their statements, read between the lines, look how many of them are coming out, giving interviews, giving conferences, They're trying to get ahead of it, because that's all that's left, is the belief that the people who got us into this mess are the ones who can get us out of it. I don't think so. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.